Father, we thank you today for your goodness. We thank you for how you blessed our lives. Lord, this morning, we just want to celebrate your goodness. We want to celebrate, God, what you've done in our lives. Lord, the purpose and the plans that you have for each one of us. Give us clear perspective today as we worship you. Help us to put aside everything else that may be on our minds this morning. And just for the next few minutes to focus on you and allow you to change our hearts, to make us uh, more the people of God that you want us to be today. We'll give you the praise. We'll give you the glory for all that's accomplished today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
desire. God, to know you, the power of your resurrection, the fellowship of your sufferings, being made conformable to your death. God, we want to die to self and become a little bit more like you today, Jesus. Help us to do that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
moment. Jesus, we love you today. We thank you that you're the all-sufficient one. We thank you for all that you've done for us, God. Everything that we have need of is in your presence, Lord, this morning. Lord, we don't want to just go through a religious routine today, God. We want an encounter with you. Jesus, we want your presence. We want you to make us whole. We want you to come and fill our hearts today. Hallelujah. Be lifted up in this place. Be adored. God, we want to put a smile on your face this morning, Jesus, because we are one of you worshipers that are worshiping you in spirit and in truth today. Hallelujah. Inhabit the praises of your people, we pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
that's our heart's desire, God, that you would shape us, that you would mold us, that you would help us to look a little bit more like you. You were made in your image and in your likeness. God, we want to reflect your glory to those who we're around this week. So fill us so full of you, God, that we're overflowing, that we're spilling out into the lives of others. God, we give you the remainder of this service. Open up our hearts to receive, God, what we need to receive from your word today. Let your word be a lamp unto our feet, God, a light unto our path, illuminating the footsteps that we ought to take. And God, we just give you praise for all that's going to be accomplished in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Bibles, go ahead and grab them. Turn to, um, I changed things up, Galatians chapter 5, if you have that. We're in the middle of a series of messages that we've been doing um, for the past few weeks um, on the foundations of the faith. How many know that there's a lot of people that have faith, a faith, in Colorado Springs? Have you found that? If you've lived here any period of time, there's lots of faith. In Colorado Springs. But how many know the Bible tells us uh, there's a faith that God wants us to have that's the faith, the right faith? And that's what we want to talk about, what we've, what we've been talking about in this series. We're not talking about faith in Buddha. We're not talking about faith in Confucius. We're not talking about faith in Muhammad and Islam. We're talking about the, the faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us at Calvary. And it's the faith. Um, that carries with it the promises of God's word. Dad, if you could help me um, for our visitors, I think we still have some of these back there. What we've been doing is kind of going through our statement of faith and, and touching on some of these in our messages in this series and establishing a foundation of what we believe as a church. And this is not just for finished work worship center. This ought to be what the church, the remnant that Jesus is coming back for, believes. Our, ba our basis for our belief shouldn't be because our denomination says so. Amen? The, the foundation of our faith shouldn't be because mom and dad or even grandma and grandpa said so. The foundation of our faith ought to be because what? The word of God says so. Amen? Amen. And so what we're hoping that you can get uh, from this series is uh, some truths that uh, you can work out practically in your life. What God says we ought to believe. Be faith. And use those principles to help you grow in your walk with the Lord. And uh, we want you to do that. We want people who, who find out about Finished Work Worship Center to not have to guess. What's probably the, one of the first things you ask if you're checking out a church? What do they believe, right? You want to know, do they have a statement of faith? Well, there you have it for our visitors today. And that just happens because you came in on the series. Um, but we have a, a statement of faith. But you know what? As a church, if you have to read through a church's statement of faith... For a long time after visiting them to find out what they believe. And you don't see it evidenced in the way they preach, in the way they sing, in the way they pray for the sick, in the way they allow the Holy Spirit to move, all those different things that are lived out practically. And this is a waste of paper, isn't it? We don't want to just have a memorized statement of faith. I've been in churches in a, in a denominational setting where the people in the church can quote the 16 foundational doctrines, but they don't live them. They don't exhibit the faith that they say, that they profess, that they believe. And we don't want to be a church like that. Amen? We want to be the remnant that Jesus is coming back for that has a living, active, passionate faith for Jesus. And I believe that's what people are looking for. Don't you? I've got some unsaved friends. I've got people that I've talked to in this community, homeless people that we've ministered to. And they're looking for people who aren't a fake, who aren't a fraud, who don't say that they believe one thing and live another. And that's why a lot of people aren't in church today. It's because they know a lot of people who have a memorized statement of faith, but they don't know very many who are demonstrating the faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And so that's what we want to get a hold of in this message today, in the, uh, the series that we're talking about. If you've missed some of our earlier messages, uh, they are on our website under the Messages tab. Uh, we post a video from, uh, on YouTube and also have an audio only and you can check those out. I think they'd be a blessing to you and kind of fill in where you've missed, um, if you've missed some of our messages. Galatians chapter 5 and uh, verse 7. Dad, would you mind reading that for me? And uh, I think we have it on the screen as well. I can just read it off the screen. I'll, I'll read it from the screen. I forgot we got it on there. Sorry about that. Galatians chapter 5, verse 7. It says, you are running the race nobly 
Who has interfered in, hindered, and stopped you from your heading and following the truth? This is from the Amplified. Um, it's not really uh, the best translation, but it brings out some of the Greek and, and different things. Different translations of this verse give a different picture. But as I was praying about this message today, this verse wasn't really even in my, um, in my notes of what I originally prepared. But the Lord just laid this on my heart today. Yesterday, our family ran a 5K downtown for St. Patrick's Day. They had a, uh, a run and a parade and a really beautiful day yesterday with the, the weather. And uh, we had about, I don't know, Monica and I were in the 5K. There's about probably three or 4,000 people lined up at the start of that race. And uh, if you've ever been to a race like that, three or 4,000 people uh, all starting at the same time can get kind of interesting, right? And this is, I want you to get a spiritual picture because the Lord just showed this to me. And maybe it means nothing to you. Maybe you have no desire to run <laughs> whatsoever. But the Apostle Paul used several illustrations similar to this, I think. And at the beginning of that race, when that gun goes off, they say to start, and you've got 4,000 people all pushed together in one little road, and they're all going in the same direction. How many of you got to be careful? You got to, I always tell Monica and the kid, the girls, you got to keep your arms wide and you keep your stance wide because if you trip and fall, what's going to happen? You're going to have about 3,855 people run over the top of you, and it may not be real good. And that's the picture I got, and this is the verse that the Lord dropped in my spirit today when we're talking about what we're talking about in this message. Paul tells the Galatians, you were running a good race. You had all the mechanics, all the preparation in place, spiritually speaking, to run a good race. Because Paul had told them the truth about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen? And uh, we've read as the beginning of our of our uh, messages the last several weeks. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You have that, Monica, as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Paul said uh, that he didn't want to know anything among them. If you do not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you except what? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why were the Galatians running a good race, spiritually speaking? Because Paul had told them about Jesus. And what he did for them at the cross. The truth. And they were able to run a good race. Run towards the goal that God had for them. To become a little bit more like Jesus every day. But then some false teachers. Some false doctrine. Tried to come in to the church in Galatia. After Paul left. And it's like when you're starting that race. Monica knows. Yesterday. 4,000 people. You start that race. All it takes is one person making a cut. And I think there's one translation, it may be the NIV, which is probably not the best translation, but some of the other uh, in, uh, translations bring in the word, who has cut in on you? You were running a good race, who has cut in on you? The King James says, who has hindered you? That would be a hindrance, wouldn't it? Someone cuts across in front of you and trips up someone's legs and you all begin to fall like dominoes, then your race is pretty much messed up. That's what happens when false doctrine and false teachers Get us off the course that Jesus wants us to be running. And we've got to be careful of that today. In the modern church, there's so many things that have uh, Scripture attached to them, but they're half-truths. Doctrines that have the Scripture may be attached in some way to it, but then they go off on a tangent that's totally contradicting the Word of God. And we need to know the truth. Amen? We need to know God's Word. We need to not only start well, not get tripped up by all the people at the start line, but keep our eyes on the finish line, amen, and run into the arms of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but one day I'm looking forward to hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And it will be because of the help of his Holy Spirit, not because of anything I have done, but because Jesus has been there to help me. And it's the same for each one of us. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 this has been our, our key verse for this whole series. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation of every doctrine that we have, the foundation of any church that you go to, their beliefs, if it's not Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross, then their foundation is weak and it will crumble. Amen? That's what the Bible says. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We have the baptism of the Holy Spirit because of what Jesus did for us at the cross. We have divine healing, which we believe in today, that is for the church today. We have it because of Jesus and the stripes he took on his back. 
before he went to Calvary. Amen? We have regeneration. We have uh, the word of God. We have the hope of Jesus coming back in the rapture very soon. All because, first of all, Jesus went to the cross. Does that make sense? It's the foundation. If we get this part wrong, the rest of our building is a mess. The rest of what we're doing with our lives is a mess. And so we need to understand the foundation of the faith that God wants us to be living in every day. The faith understands that the cross is where we humble ourselves, not just once for salvation. That's important. And if you have not done that, you can have a personal daily relationship with Jesus Christ. What an awesome encounter, isn't it? To say, Jesus, I give you my past, my sins. I give you my life. Jesus, I want to live for you. I accept what you did for me at the cross, and I want to be saved. But it's not just one time that we go to the cross, but we um, go to the cross every day. Paul the Apostle says, I die daily. He wasn't talking about a physical death. He was talking about spiritually, laying aside his flesh, his wants, and his desires for Jesus' desires. We go to the cross every day so that we can become a little bit more like Jesus. And if you have no other idea of what God's purpose is for your life, God, what do you want me to be doing? What's my role? What's my function here in Colorado Springs? What's my role, my function in the church, the, the body of Christ that you're coming back for? If you have no other purpose, your purpose is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 8. And to become, that means to become a little bit more like him every day. Stop measuring yourself up against every other Christian. Well, I'm trying to be at least as spiritual as pastor so-and-so or evangelist so-and-so or brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, whoever we think are the most spiritual people in the church, and start putting ourselves up next to Jesus. And how many know we'll always have room to grow? Amen? That's our goal. That's what we should be looking to is Jesus Christ. So we're looking at today um, the last, uh, second to last um, little bullet point on the statement of faith. We believe in the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit by uh, whose indwelling the Christian is enabled to live a holy life. And it gives some scriptures there. We believe in sanctification. You hear very few churches preach about sanctification today. There's probably very few churches who really believe uh, in scriptural sanctification. There are some churches who believe that once you get saved and you accept Jesus into your life, that you're entirely, perfectly sanctified. And how many know if you stub your toe on the corner of the coffee table in the middle of the night, you've disproven that theory, that teaching right then, haven't you? Because <laughs> probably the first thing that comes out of your mind is not praise Jesus, hallelujah, glory be to God. You're probably rolling on the floor, you know, thinking of other words that may not be pleasing to the Lord. But thankfully the Lord is patient with us, amen? And he's still working on us. We are set apart positionally. And our position do doesn't change once we've accepted Jesus Christ. We're saved and we're set apart. We're sanctified as his own. It means he writes his name on our, our lives. But we're also a work in progress. It's progressive. We're always becoming a little bit more like Jesus. Until when? Until we stand before him one day in heaven and we see him face to face. But until then, we're all a work in progress. And God's doing a work on us. And that's what we're going to look at today. Three items that we need to know about sanctification. Number one, what does it mean to be sanctified? What does it mean to be sanctified? The primary meaning is a dedication or a consecration, a setting apart for a specific and holy use. And is that your heart's desire today? God, I want my life to be dedicated to you. I want people to have no doubt when they look at how I live my life that I set it apart for you, that it's got a holy purpose. God, it's got your purpose in mind. That should be our heart's desire. That's what sanctified means. Look at Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26. It says this, And you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. God tells us that today, that he wants us to be separate from the world. We ought to have a distinction. The church that Jesus Christ is coming back for is not going to be a church that's mixed with the world, is it? That's mixed with, with, with uh, psychology, psychiatry, man's wisdom, and man's philosophy. It's going to be a church that's separate, that's distinct, that's holy, that's his own, that he's coming back for. And if we're going to be sanctified, 
That's what the, the Lord is talking about. He wants us to be holy. The only way we can be holy is to have more of the Holy One inside of our lives. And that's Jesus. Amen. It's not by religious disciplines that we become more holy, is it? If I could read eight chapters of my Bible instead of three and become more holy, then that would be something incredible, right? Jesus wouldn't have had to come and die on the cross. I could just read more chapters of my Bible. Now, is it important to read your Bible? Yes. But it's not by our disciplines that we become more holy. In a lot of churches, that's what they're teaching. You've got to do more praying. You've got to do more Bible reading. And that's a half-truth. We need to be in the Bible. We need to be praying. We need to have spiritual disciplines. But we become more holy when we have more of Jesus in our lives. Not because we just have activity, wheels in motion, things happening that are religious. Amen? It's because we have Jesus. And when I open my Bible... And it's not just so I can check off that I read eight chapters today, but I open up my Bible. I've done that before. Have any of you? But the Lord's taught me. That's not where holiness is. He's not impressed. It's his word. He is the living word. He's not impressed with that. But what he is impressed with is our heart attitude. When I open up the Bible and say, God, I've got to have something from you today. Even if it's just one verse before I go to, to do my work or go to school, God, I've got to hear from you today. I've got a heart of faith in you, Jesus, that you can speak to me through this word. And you can make a difference in my life today. You see how that's a whole lot different? I've given as an example before, I did prison ministry when I was in Bible college. We went to LTI, Louisiana Training Institute, where uh, young men, one ages, um, children up through 18. Some of them sometimes would go there until they're 20, depending on what crime they had committed. And then when they turned 21, they would go to the adult prison full of, of young men who had committed all kinds of different crimes. And we would go in and minister to them. And there was this one young man named, uh, named uh, James. And he, would, he had the Bible memorized. He could quote verses. And I grew up in a Bible quiz program in the Assemblies of God, so I had a lot of scriptures memorized. And I had really admired someone who knew the Word of God, and who, who not just had a head memorized, but understood how to apply it in their life. This guy, uh, James, uh, would come in and and we would go into the dorms first and then try and get them to come to the service later. And we'd have an opportunity to go in. I'd go into the dorms and talk with James, and he would begin to quote scriptures to me. And I was like, wow. you know. And he did it on purpose. But his purpose wasn't because he had a hunger for God and the things of God. His desire was to trip up the preachers who came into that prison because he sometimes knew more than they did. And to, to use scriptures to show the contradictions, you know, that he had studied or that he thought were contradictions in the word of God. And, uh, you know, he was surprised, I think, that that uh, me, myself and some of the others, sometimes we just said, I don't know, but let's look in the word of God together and find out what God meant by that. Let's really research the whole of scripture to make sure that's not a, 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 that there is no contradiction there. And I believe the Lord began to, to move, and James would come to service, and God's Spirit began to move. It was more than just memorizing scriptures for a head knowledge to make the preacher look bad. He actually began to see that this is a living word, that it makes a difference in our life. Maybe you know of college professors. If you ever went to a secular university, they know the scriptures, don't they? And they know how to twist them to make a Christian look foolish if the Christian doesn't know the word of God. So it's not spiritual disciplines that make us holy. It's a heart of faith in Jesus and using those disciplines to strengthen that faith. Do we understand that? Does that make sense? That's what God wants to do in our lives. He wants us to be sanctified by getting more of Jesus in our hearts. Each member of the church is especially set apart to bring glory to God. Is that your heart's desire? Do you pray that over your family? God, I want my family to bring glory to you. I don't want to cause any stain. I don't want to taint the reflection of who you are, Jesus, to anyone that I come in contact with this week. So help me to have the right uh, thoughts. Help me to have the right heart attitude. Help the words that come out of my mouth, Jesus, be glorifying to you. That's part of the sanctification process. The secondary meaning of sanctification is that of cleansing and purging from moral defilement. And this is a progressive experiment, uh, experience in God's shaping us and molding us. And usually, what is it that identifies that there's still a work in progress in our life? Out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. We get in a pressure situation, and what often reveals where our heart is really at? The things that come out of our mouth. Have you ever said something, and you're like, wow, did I just say that? <laughs> did I say that out loud? And God begins to reveal that there's still some things that need to change. 
in our life. Maybe it's that person who cuts us off in traffic. There's some crazy people on the roads. If everybody could just drive as good as I do, right? Um, then the world would be a better place. Or you're in a sports event that I'm very competitive. When you get competitive, get put in a situation where you know somebody fouls you in a basketball game or does something against the rules. That's when the things in your heart begin to come out, isn't it? When we're pressed, when there's hard things happening in our life that are out of our control. And we need to allow the Lord to do that progressive work. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 6, the last two verses of this chapter, and then the first verse of chapter 7. It says, So come out from among unbelievers and separate, sever yourselves from them, says the Lord. Touch not any unclean thing. Then I will receive you kindly and treat you with favor. Verse 18, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7, verse 1, Therefore, since these great promises are ours, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates and defiles body and spirit, and bring our consecration to completeness in the reverential fear of God. We can't really sanctify ourselves by getting some soap and washing our hands and making our hands clean, right? That's kind of the language that the Bible uses. But really what it's talking about, how can we cleanse ourselves? How can we, after we've already been saved and we get dirty again? Because it happens, doesn't it? First John says, if you say you don't have acts of sin in your life, uh, in a sinful nature that's supposed to be dormant, if you say that you don't, you make God a liar. Just because we get saved doesn't mean we're not tempted with sin. Satan just doesn't go away and say, oh, well, they're saved now. I'm not going to bother them anymore. We still have an issue with sin. So what happens when we get dirty hands again? What happens when we trip and fall in the race that we're supposed to be running because we let someone cut in on us? We have to get back up and go back to the same place that we started, don't we? We have to go back to the cross. That's how we sanctify ourselves. That's how we can cleanse ourselves. That's how we can re-consecrate, rededicate our lives to Jesus is by going back to his cleansing power, the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. And that's where sanctification can take place. And sanctification is an ongoing process. Number two, we know what it means to be sanctified. What are three aspects of sanctification. There's the initial act of sanctification, which I said was positional. When we get saved, the moment a person is born again, he is said to be sanctified. Jesus says, you're sanctified. You're set apart as my own. You belong to me. And that's important. The devil he gets reminded, doesn't he? But I believe the Lord. This one belongs to me. You can't touch them. You can see that in the story of Job. The, the enemy has to ask permission before he can do anything. God doesn't cause the bad things in our life, but he allows it sometimes for a strengthening of our faith as he did in the life of Job. So God sets us apart positionally at first. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11 it says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We used to be in sin. We used to be tainted and tarnished by the enemy. But now we've been washed, we've been sanctified. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 says, But of him, talking about God, are you in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. How can we be set apart and consecrated by being in who? In Jesus Christ hidden in Christ. When the enemy comes to find you, to tempt you, or to cause problems in your life, he can't find you because you're in Jesus Christ. And how many know he's not going to mess with Jesus? He already got beat up quite badly at the cross, at Calvary. He remembers that quite well. And when you bring up the cross, when you bring up the blood of Jesus, when you bring up the finished work, how many know Satan understands that? The church may not understand that, but Satan understands that. We need to be hidden in Jesus Christ. If this sanctification process is going to progress as God wants it to a little bit more every day. It's when we get outside of Christ that we have problems. And the enemy, we're vulnerable to the enemy's attacks. But in Jesus Christ, we can grow. We can be the people that God wants us to be. The process of sanctification is not just positional, but it's practical. We've got to get into the Bible, don't we? We've got to pray. We've got to have spiritual disciplines. You've got to go to church. You've got to witness. You've got to praise and worship God. There's a lot of disciplines that help us with the right focus 
If we're trying to impress God with brownie points, that's not the right focus. But if, Jesus, I want to know you more. I want to grow. That's why I'm coming to church, God. That's why I'm praying today. It's because, God, I've got to have your wisdom and your direction. Then God's going to strengthen us, and we're going to grow by practically doing the things that we ought to be doing. What they have positionally, they must seek experientially. Sanctification is seen to be a continuing process through a Christian's entire lifetime. And it ought to be. It ought to be something that's growing. There ought to be evidence, proof in our life that since we got saved until today, that the Lord, by His Holy Spirit, is bringing about change, making us look a little bit more like Jesus. Can you look at your own life and think about when you first got saved and the difference that, that Jesus has made, how things are so much different and how it's, it, you've grown, you've learned? It doesn't mean it's always been good times. Sometimes the Lord teaches us the most through the difficult times. Amen. After you've gone through the valley and you come up on the other side, you've learned some things. And the Lord teaches us. We ought to be able to look back at that. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. God's intention is that we grow. Amen. That we not stay in the same place spiritually and become stagnant or stale in our faith, but that we grow. Romans 8, 29. A lot of scriptures for you, but hopefully you'll write them down and meditate on this message and look at what God's telling us today. Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew, how many people is that? God, talking about God, Jesus. How many people did Jesus foreknow? Everybody. Everybody. Make some common sense before you swallow a false doctrine of predestination. Because this is the verse that they use a lot of times for predestination. For whom he foreknew, that's everyone, right? Because he's omniscient, Jesus knows everyone. For whom he foreknew, he also what? Predestined. The only place in the Bible where that word is used in reference to, to people. He's predestined everyone, right? Because it's as many as he foreknew, and that's everyone, he also predestined. So that means everyone is predestined. So the false doctrine that a lot of people believe that some people were born and they were predestined for heaven, and some people were born and they were predestined for hell, doesn't this scripture rip that totally apart? Know the truth. Don't let someone cut in on you, on your race. God wants everyone to be saved. Well, why isn't everyone saved, Pastor Eric? Because of their choice, not God's. Amen? It's not God's choice. God's choice is that everyone he foreknew also pre be predestined for what purpose? To be conformed to the image of his son. He wants your neighbor to become a little bit more like Jesus. He wants your unsaved loved one to become a little bit more like Jesus. He wants you who already gotten saved to not have just one encounter with him, but to continue to be conformed to the image of his son. Does that make sense? He wants everyone to grow and become a little bit more like Jesus, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus came to be our perfect example, to lead the way of how we ought to live our lives. And he wants us to become like Jesus. Can you imagine how frustrating that is to the enemy? He thought if I could crucify this Jesus, if I could kill him, I can stop the work that he's doing, that God is doing in this earth. But what he really did is he created a bunch of more Jesuses, didn't he? We're not by any means equal to Jesus, and I'm not saying that. But when the Spirit of God is moving in our lives, Jesus said himself, greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. So Satan thought he got rid of Jesus by killing him on the cross through the Romans and the Jews. But what he really did was release the spirit of Christ and the spirit of God into every human being to become more like Jesus and to be his image and his likeness in this earth. That's God's purpose for our lives. That's what we want to be set apart for is so that Jesus' work can continue. Philippians 1.6. Philippians 1.6. It says this. Many of us can quote this verse. I am convinced and sure of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. God didn't start dealing with your heart, however many years ago it was, to abandon you today. Maybe somebody needs to hear that this morning. He didn't start the work in you to abandon you, to leave it unfinished. If you've seen that big hotel up on uh, InterQuest Parkway, developers built this 12-story hotel. Very nice place. Looks like it could be a Hilton or a Doubletree. And then they pulled out, couldn't fund it. And it's been sitting there for three or four years. That's not the kind of work Jesus does in our lives. 
He will bring it to completion. He will perfect that which concerns him in our lives. If we'll stay uh, submitted to Jesus at the foot of the cross every day, saying, God, I want to grow. I want to become more like you. God, refine me. Purify me. Take away the things that aren't pleasing to you. That's the work God wants to do. The flesh cannot be overcome by eradication. It always will be there as long as we are in this earthly body. Neither can it be overcome by suppression. You can beat yourself up. I'm going to fast 40 days and get rid of my flesh. No, you won't. If you could fast 40 days and get rid of your flesh, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. You could have just fasted your sins away. Be careful. The modern church is preaching that. Some have earnestly tried to gain victory by the power of their will. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I'm going to stop doing that that I know doesn't please God. No, you won't. You'll stop for a week or two, and you'll be right back to it because your nature is sinful. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit dominating your life, your sinful nature will dominate your life. And it may be for a week or so that you're able to stop doing it, but eventually it will come back. The victory that is seen, that God is talking about through sanctification, is only through identification with Jesus Christ. Not through beating ourselves up, not through thinking that our sinful nature is totally gone. We know that's not true. Uh, it won't be totally gone until we get to heaven. It's unplugged, and it shouldn't be functioning in our lives because we've said, Jesus, you're my Lord, not sin. Sin is not going to have power over my life anymore. Jesus, you are. But it's not gone. And if we feed our sinful nature, it will grow. It will dominate us. Uh, Jesus talks about complete and final sanctification. And that's only going to come when we stand before Jesus Christ. We don't have complete and total sinless perfection until we stand before Jesus and we receive the end of our salvation. Say when he says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of my kingdom. That's when we can know the struggle with sin is gone. The sinful nature is gone. That's when we'll have sinless perfection. And not any time, if you get a sinless perfection, what does the Bible tell us about Enoch? He's probably about the closest one to that. You won't be here anymore, right? God will just go ahead and take you home. And I don't think any of us that are still here have, have attained that. Um, a couple more scriptures and then we'll close. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. Look at this verse. 1 Thessalonians 3, 13. So that he may strengthen and confirm and establish your hearts faultlessly pure and unblameable in holiness in the sight of our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints, the holy and glorified people. Amen. So be it. Jesus is not coming back for a weak, emaciated church that's barely getting by, that's still bogged down in sin and trying to overcome the same sins that they have for 10 years. That's not the picture that the Bible gives us of the church Jesus is coming back for. He's coming back for a radiant church, amen? For a church that's without spot or wrinkle, not because of our efforts, but we're washed in the blood of the Lamb because of what Jesus has done for us. Let Him cleanse you, not just once when you get saved, but continually say, Jesus, shape me, mold me, make me the person that you want me to be. How can we position ourselves for sanctification? We'll close with this this morning. We can position ourselves for sanctification by having faith, with Jesus Christ and his finished work as the object of our faith. Not faith in a church, not faith in a denomination, not faith in a preacher, not faith in the latest trend or fad that's coming through the church, but faith in what Jesus did 2,000 years ago on the cross for us. It was not only for our forgiveness of sins, but it broke the power of sin over our life. It was for our healing. It's for our hope of heaven. It's for us to have access to the power of the Holy Spirit Everything that we need for life and godliness, 2 Peter 1.3, was provided for us by what Jesus did at the cross. And if we really believe that, we'll live a different life, amen, than most people who just go to church and say they have faith. If we believe that Jesus died on Calvary to give us everything that we need for life and godliness, it works out practically in our lives, doesn't it? When we get a headache, instead of just taking the Tylenol or the Excedrin first, there's nothing wrong with that, don't get me wrong. But we say, Jesus, you died to heal me of this headache. And Jesus, touch my head. Touch this disease that I'm suffering with. And the doctors have given me this diagnosis. Before we go and try all these other things, we, we go to Jesus first. Does that make sense? If we really believe that he died to give us everything that we need for life and godliness, we'll position ourselves with that kind of faith every day. And that's what Jesus is looking for. Obedience to the word. Look at this prayer of Jesus. John 17, verse 17. 
Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Okay, we've got to have obedience. Jesus is praying that we'll be sanctified. How? By knowing the truth. Not the half-truth that has the lie attached to it. But we know the truth of Jesus. We know how to run this race because Jesus gave us his own example. He ran the same race, didn't he? Jesus ran the same race. He's saying, don't go for the shortcut. Don't let someone cut in on you. Keep your eyes fixed on the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, and run to the finish line. Amen? That's what he's saying to us today. Be sanctified. Be set apart. Be yielded to the Holy Spirit. That's how we can be positioned for sanctification. God, I don't know what I need in my life, but you do. When we're in a service where God's Spirit is moving, just yielding to that. Saying, God, I want to feel your presence making a difference in my life. God will do that. And then personal commitment. Um, Romans 12, 1 and 2, most of us can quote. Let's look at that and we'll close. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. What's wrong with a living sacrifice? Most sacrifices are dead, right? You put them there, they stay there. <laughs> but a living sacrifice, when the fire gets hot, sometimes we say, ouch, right? And we get off the altar. But we have to, by commitment, because we want to become more like Jesus, lay our lives down and say, I want to be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God wants us to be sanctified. He wants us to be set apart, not just positionally once when we get saved, but every day growing, going back to the cross and saying, Jesus, I need your forgiveness again today. I fell down today, Jesus. I need you to pick me up and get me back in the race. God, my hands are dirty because I allowed uh, things to come into my life that feed my sinful nature instead of being led by your spirit, saying, God, I can't do this on my own. I need your help. I need the power of your Holy Spirit. I come back to the cross once again for your cleansing, for your sanctifying. Jesus will do that if we'll, if we'll go that way and position ourselves in the way that he wants us to. And it's something that's going to happen from now until we stand before him. And we hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Sanctification, becoming a little bit more like Jesus, it requires that we, like the Apostle Paul, die daily. Amen? We die daily. That we keep our lives daily at the foot of the cross. And we need to get ready. We need to get pure. We need to get right with God. Because I believe, as we said earlier in this message, He's getting ready to move one more time powerfully by His Spirit. And we can be a part of that last day's outpouring, or we can be deceived by the false doctrine and the, the, the trends and fads and be led astray and be part of the great falling away. I'd rather be a part of the great move of God and see my family saved, see this community turned around for Jesus. Amen? There will be a highway of holiness that goes through Colorado Springs. Amen? Our heart's desire is that Colorado Springs not just be known because Pikes Peak's here. That's beautiful. That's part of God's creation. He gets the glory for that. And even though we call it Garden of the Gods, we know it's Garden of the God, right? And even though we have the Air Force Academy and those things, which are good things to have a reputation for the city, wouldn't it be a much more incredible reputation that Colorado Springs is a place where God's Spirit is moving, where people are getting saved, amen, where things powerful are happening for the glory of God. But we can be a part of that if we want what He wants. If we stop wanting what we want and we say, God, I want what you want, that we begin to seek Him for that and allow Him to separate us to Himself a little bit more every day. Would you stand with me? We're going to close in prayer. I want us to sing that song, I want to be more like you, Jesus, one more time. And as we do that, every time God speaks, he wants an answer from us. Do you believe that? I believe that's true. And as a good heavenly father, um, he doesn't want us to ignore when he's speaking to us. And I don't know what the Lord is speaking to you today, how he wants you to respond. He, each of us may be in a different place spiritually. I know if you're not saved and you don't have Jesus as your Savior, that's the most critical decision that you could make this morning. If you don't have him as your savior, if you haven't accepted what he did for you at the cross and ask him to not only cleanse your past sins, but to break the power and the dominion of sin off of your life, the grip of sin off your life, um, Satan is having his way with you. 
He's able to do whatever he wants in your life. And if you've not made that decision, it's all you, decision all you have to do is receive it. It's a free gift. Say, Jesus, I believe what you did at Calvary, what you did when you died on the cross was for my sins, to give me forgiveness of my past, and to help me to live a life that you want me to live in holiness and righteousness from this day forward. And, and just ask God to forgive you. He'll, he'll forgive you. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, that's not confession to a priest. That's saying what God says about what's going on in your life. It's really more of an agreement with God. If we confess our sins, we come into agreement with what he says about sin in our life. He says, I will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so if you need to do that today, as we pray, as we close this service, do business with God. Say, God, forgive me. I want my life to be dedicated to you or rededicated to you. But maybe you're, everything is right with God, and this morning you just need to pray for someone that the Lord's put upon your heart. However the Lord is speaking to you today, maybe there's some areas of growth that the Holy Spirit has put his finger on in your life, talking about sanctification, and you know, Jesus, I need to grow in that area. Let's position ourselves, amen, in a place where the Lord can do a work in our hearts this morning. Those blemishes, 
that we've seen as we've looked into the mirror of your word this morning. And Lord, help us to repent. Help us to come back to the foot of the cross and allow you to cleanse us, to wash us with the blood of Christ. Lord, I pray that each one of us in this room this morning would be in Jesus Christ, walking and growing and becoming more the person of God that you want us to be. Lord, let what we've heard in this message today about sanctification, let it be something that we meditate on this week and that we put into practice, that people won't have to guess what we believe about sanctification, but Lord, that they'll, they'll see a hunger, that they'll see a passion that we have about you, Jesus, that we're not satisfied with what we've already experienced, but God, we want more of what you have for us. God, fill us so full of your Holy Spirit, so full of faith that we're a part of this last day's harvest, God, that you're going to bring. Lord, help us to reach out to those who are weak in faith, those who have lost faith, those who need Jesus desperately in their lives and they're in the process of dying without Jesus in their life. Give us divine appointments this week that we can sow a seed of the gospel into their lives. God, we thank you for that. Lord, we, we thank you that you see every need that's represented in this room today. I pray for breakthrough. I pray for answers to prayer. I pray, God, that you'll meet every need financially, emotionally, spiritually, physically today for your glory and for your honor. Bless us as we leave this place today. I pray that you'll bless our baptismal, baptismal service. God, let it be a time of celebration and rejoicing. Give us a good week. God, help us uh, to represent you well to everyone that we come in contact with this week. We just give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen.